welcome to everyone. Welcome to fall kickoff worship at Westminster and to our inclusive family of faith. We particularly welcome our visitors and those joining us on the YouTube. Our third reading this morning comes from Romans 12, verses 9 through 21. Listen to the word of God. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But no, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be be to God. God. It's time for another confession from your pastor. I like to win. 
Maybe that's an understatement. It might be closer to say, I need to win. Growing up, whether it was club soccer or recreational basketball, arguments at the dinner table or playing cards at recess, I really, really, really enjoyed winning. I liked that sense of satisfaction and seeing your own talents at play, that sense of accomplishment that somehow I have bested my opponent. When a girl pushed me on the soccer field, I would bide my time and find a way to pay her back, often by winning. During seminary on our kickball team, I might have been told that I was the most competitive female they had ever met. I took it as a compliment. More than once, coaches and parents and friends have told me, you know, it's not about winning or losing, it's about how you play the game. I would smile and nod and secretly think, I play to win. <laughs> Needless to say, with God's great and abundant sense of humor, God called me to ministry. The practice of ministry, so called because I am constantly failing forward. Apparently, following Jesus and equipping others to do the same is less about winning at all costs. I had to reorganize my life's playbook in light of the gospel, in light of the good news that describes our Christian team and what our team owner sets forth in God's playbook. Our epistle reading this morning is pretty much a list of play-by-play -play for God's people. The Apostle Paul has spent 11 chapters describing the saving grace of Jesus Christ, the inclusive grace of God that welcomes both Jews and Gentiles to the team. Paul builds on that foundation in chapter 12, teaching the new Christians how to live their lives according to God's heart and in light of the grace we've already received. For the team made up of these earliest Christians, Paul was their coach, teaching them how to play the game of faith. They were still learning what it meant to follow Jesus, how people would know that they are Christians by their love or by the food they ate or who they married or how they acted. They were still discerning what plays should be in God's playbook for Christians. In some Bibles, this section that we heard this morning is called Marks of a True Christian. I think of the marks that fill a coach's playbooks. You know, the X's and the O's and the arrows that point in the right directions. And as the team study and practice together, the playbook tells them where they should be at any given time and what part they should be playing. While the playbook doesn't cover every possibility in a game, it teaches the team how to understand the game. It lays the foundation for both the expected and unexpected curves that come their way. When we look at the X's and O's in God's playbook, we see how to live a cross-shaped life that reflects the inclusive and sacrificial love we have received from God. With 23 imperative statements in this one section, Paul does not mince words as he offers his pep talk and his expectations for God's team. The first part of God's playbook here describes our internal plays, how we treat our teammates in God's team in Christian community, how we keep our faith fueled up and ready to go, how we worship God rightly. We often know some of these plays like the back of our hands. You can almost imagine a huddle of early Christians and hearing Coach Paul tell them, come on guys, you got this. Let your love be genuine. Love from the center of who you are. Serve the Lord. Extend hospitality to strangers. Be like a luxury mattress store who opens their doors to hurricane evacuees. Or be like the Coast Guard who rescued an estimated 11,000 people this past week. But then the plays get a little trickier. 
outdo one another in showing honor. That is, spend more time building your teammates up than focusing on yourself. In our celebrity athlete culture, that's hard to imagine that after scoring a touchdown, a player would lift up his teammates rather than claiming the glory for himself. Or a colleague at work gives all the credit to someone else instead of striving for her own promotion. Yet all of these plays are about living our lives turned toward others, serving the Lord by welcoming strangers and loving like family, even when they don't deserve it. The second part of God's playbook focuses on how we treat the wider community, how we live among people who may not subscribe to the same set of beliefs or who may even be out to harm us. We bless them, rejoice with them, weep with them, associate with the lowly and the powerless, stay humble, Leave peaceably with all. And this all is not just people we like. Paul takes it one step further and argues that the mark of a true Christian is not just how we treat our teammates, but about how we treat our biggest rivals, our perceived enemies. Here he builds on Jesus' teaching, encouraging us to bless those who persecute us and never, ever to seek vengeance. In fact, he says, do not return their evil, but instead kill them with kindness. Share the table with them. Share a meal and a cup. He bookends this section by returning to the big picture of the struggle between evil and goodness, exhorting the Romans to not let evil overcome them, but instead to overcome evil with good. The last two verses in today's playbook come from teachings in Proverbs and Deuteronomy, asserting that God is God and we are not. Today's playbook was built on the tradition of years past and the word that shaped Jesus' faith and life. As the embodiment of the word of God, Jesus didn't just talk about loving your enemies. He actively practiced it by continuing to preach and heal and teach those who were out to get him. Jesus didn't just talk about persevering in prayer. He sweated through the prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus didn't just talk about resisting evil. He submitted to death on a cross in order to overcome it. The resurrection is the ultimate proof for Paul of overcoming evil with good, overcoming death with life. So we too who live in a world dominated by death and destruction need to take the pages out of God's playbook. We need to experience resurrection in our own lives and then bring that resurrected attitude, motivation, and living to the wider community. Like responding to a visible resurgence of racism by having the hard conversations about being anti-racist in Sunday school. Or responding to the fear of the other by extending hospitality to strangers through backpacks and school supplies, or bags of New Day food, or the gift of a quilt. Or responding to homophobia and transphobia by banding with other churches to form the Inclusive Faith Coalition. When I served my church in Topeka, we had a quiet, simple way that we practiced overcoming evil with goodness. You see, Topeka is home to Westboro Baptist Church, the people who love to picket at the funerals of American soldiers and declare that God hates a segment of our population. They also enjoyed picketing my church because I had the audacity to preach while being a woman. Rather than hate them back or retaliate by picketing their church, we started a campaign against hate. 
On our own terms, each individually, we picked a charity and we picked amount of money, say 50 cents. Every time we saw them holding their signs of hate around town, we logged that 50 cents to our mental bank. And when that bank filled up, we each donated that money to a life-giving organization like building schools in El Salvador or taking care of animals at the Humane Society or giving backpacks to students in need. We did not return evil for evil. We did not let evil define our position, but instead we chose to cling to what is good. Now, I have to warn you, following God's playbook and choosing good over evil does not guarantee that we will have an injury-free season. In fact, Paul crafts plays of how to respond in the face of danger and persecution in times of suffering and weeping in the shadow of evil. We witnessed a lot of goodness this week in response to Hurricane Harvey. One of the most moving things I saw was Victoria White an evacuee from Houston who led others in the middle of a shelter singing, Spirit, break out. In the midst of great loss and an uncertain future, Ms. White was able to persevere in prayer and worship, seeking the Holy Spirit even in the midst of a hurricane shelter. She seemed to know God's playbook by heart and that it had something for her to hold on to in that moment. For God's playbook doesn't come out of a vacuum. It's based on the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the source of all life, the One who called us off the bench and into the game. When we follow God's playbook by clinging to good and resisting evil, by not shying away from the big issues, by showering goodness on those who have done evil to us, We testify to the revolutionary power of Jesus Christ and glorify the owner of our team, God. When we strive to outdo ourselves to honor one another, outsiders will look at our community and want to be on this team. When we weep with each other as well as rejoice with each other, we reflect the commitment that God has to us. Our worship of God pours out of our team practice in here and into the wider world, into the big game. And as we gear up for our new season here at WPC, I invite you to pick out one particular play, one particular directive from Coach Paul to be your spiritual discipline this fall. What aspect of your game do you need to work on? Clinging to what is good in the world, what God has given to us. Standing up against evil and injustice instead of silently tolerating it. Showing kindness to those who mistreat you. What play do you need to become more familiar with? Living peaceably and in harmony instead of always having to be right? Seeking reconciliation instead of revenge? Associating with the lowly instead of the powerful? Offering radical hospitality in your heart and your home? Reclaiming your zeal and your fire for the Lord? Who else on our team can you learn from? Who else on your team can you give and receive advice? For when we follow God's playbook, it's not about winning or losing. It's about how we play the game. And we say that not because winning doesn't matter, but because we have already won. Christ has assured us the victory through His sacrifice. And if we already know the score, if we already know how it turns out, we can focus then on listening to our coach and following His plays. When we use God's playbook, we might even find that enemies are transformed into teammates, The bench warmers become the stars, and good refuses to be defeated by evil. God has laid the playbook out for us and calls us to get into the game. Are you ready to practice these plays over and over again, learning and relearning our parts in the game? 
Are you ready to recommit to God's team to keep your talents in Arlington for another season? We cannot do it without you. All the positions are important and needed to run God's place. So let us start working out our love muscles along with our muscles of patience and self-control so that we can continue to create the community God intends for us. With certain victory at the end of the game, we can fully embrace each play in the moment, seeking for ways to more fully understand our coach, manager, and team owner. May we keep God's playbook in our heart throughout this week and forevermore. Amen.